This segment is brought to you by Asian Cultural Alliance. This gate has gone on for over a year now. Tai Ing-wen's entourage continues to use its influence to make poor excuses that look and sound official. But in reality, all of these falsehoods serve to obscure the truth. Tai's team then makes every effort to censor any mention of Thesis Gate in the media. One year later, there is still no mention of Thesis Gate or its investigation on television. Most print and digital media outlets report on Thesis Gate from Tai Ing-wen's point of view. Skeptics are silenced and hidden from the public's view. Taiwan's television outlets are at the mercy of the National Communications Council, which silently suppresses information it finds unsavory. Furthermore, throughout the past four years, the Thai administration has offered over 10 billion new Taiwan dollars in government contracts to win over the media. Thai uses both the carrot and the stick to control public opinion. Until now, many of those who believe in Thai's thesis insist that the existence of a degree proves the existence of a thesis. Those people say that the degree's existence was validated in a statement made by the London School of Economics and Political Science on October 8, 2019. But how trustworthy is this information? In 2013, Sri Lanka was also hit with an academic dishonesty scandal involving the London School of Economics and Political Science. The accused was the son of the Sri Lankan president, Sajith Primadasa. Sri Lanka's Colombo Telegraph discovered that Primadasa did not fully complete his undergraduate course in international relations at the London School of Economics and Political Science. The Colombo Telegraph launched an investigation into the matter, and when they did, the school released the following statement. Our records show that Sajith Premadasa graduated from the London School of Economics and Political Science with an undergraduate degree in international relations in 1989. We do not allow students to graduate who have not completed their course of study. I would be grateful, therefore, if you could let me know why you believe Mr. Premadasa did not complete his studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science. The London School of Economics and Political Science's reaction to the Colombo Telegraph is the same as its reaction to Dr. Huan Xilin's inquiries into Tsai Ing-wen. Just five days after the scandal first broke, Primadasa admitted to the Colombo Telegraph that he did not participate in the school's final exams due to a case of the measles. After Primadasa's confession, the London School of Economics and Political Science came forward and said that they gave out faulty information. They retracted their statement and issued an apology. The question here is, why was the school so quick to jump to Primadasa's defense when they themselves weren't completely clear on the matter? Was this the first time the London School of Economics and Political Science defended a false claim? What does this say about standard operating procedures at the school? Can they be trusted when it comes to Tsai's thesis? Strangely enough, the school official who first came to Primadasa's defense also played a role during our investigation into Tsai's thesis. This can't be a mere coincidence. Thesis Gate will ultimately come down to a battle of evidence. Tai's lawsuit against the three scholars has gone on for nearly 10 months now. 
prosecutors have moved at a snail's pace with their investigation. However, Dr. Dennis Pang struck a preemptive blow by filing his own lawsuit against presidential office spokesperson Xavier Chang in hopes of moving thesis state forward. Inevitably, Chang attempted to use official statements and explanations from the London School of Economics and Political Science in his defense. From what happened in Sri Lanka, we know that the school will continue to stand by its statements until there is undeniable proof that runs contrary to what they say. Knowing this, Chang and the Formosa transnational law firm offered up flimsy articles of evidence to stall court proceedings. They submitted Facebook posts and online news articles to the court as evidence. Their actions were a mockery to the judicial process. So much so that Judge Zhou Yuxuan couldn't help but ask Chang, you expect me to extrapolate the truth from photocopies? In response to the evasive game that Tsai's entourage was playing, Pang's lawyers decided to play hardball. Their strategy came down to agreeing with the defense. They played into the opposition's schemes, but they also insisted on seeing hard, conclusive evidence. By doing so, the burden of proof was still with the presidential office. The presidential office had no compunction about showing Tsai's degree before, so where was it now? If they could produce it and prove its authenticity, then they could shut down Thesis Gate forever. In theory, Tsai should have all of these documents in her possession. We know this because these documents were shown at press conferences in recent months. She could no longer hide behind the defense of 35 years ago. On the other hand, however, if Thesis Gate could identify even one flaw, one inconsistency, one imperfection with Tsai's degree, then the tides would turn. However, such a move would not only help the Thesis Gate movement, it would also be good for Tsai's entourage. On September 4, 2019, the presidential office published images of Tsai's degree, student record, and Viva notification memo to their Facebook page. On September 23rd, the presidential office held a press conference where they shared other school documents relevant to Tsai's time at the London School of Economics and Political Science. However, Formosa Transnational never once brought out any original documentation related to Tsai's education during this court case. They continued to evade Peng's lawyers and their hardball strategy. The presidential office showed off Tsai's degree before, but it never surfaced in the court case between Cheng and Peng, where it would have mattered the most. Instead, they submitted unreliable evidence like messages congratulating Tsai on her re-election from officials in other countries as proof of Tsai's legitimacy. Defense Evidence Number 15, UK Foreign Secretary's Statement on Tsai's Re-Election Defense Evidence Number 16, US Secretary of State's Statement on Tsai's Re-Election Defense Evidence Number 17, Twitter Post on Tsai's Re-Election by US Congressman Joe Biden Defense Evidence Number 18, Twitter Post by US Assistant Secretary of State Defense Evidence Number 21, Twitter post by Canadian Parliamentarian. Defense evidence number 22, Twitter post by Canadian Parliamentarian. Defense evidence number 23, Twitter post by former head of Spanish government of Catalonia. Defense evidence number 24, Twitter post from former Haitian foreign minister. Defense evidence number 25, Twitter post from head of Israel Economic and Cultural Office in Taipei.
Indeed, the evidence listed above are not mere copies. They are original and authentic. But just because someone writes Dr. Tsai Ing-wen on Twitter doesn't mean that Tsai has a doctorate. Twitter posts are not legally binding. If they were, then Joe Biden would have to honor a tweet saying that he would return 3,000 Bitcoin to anyone who sent him 1,000 Bitcoin posted when his account was hacked. One can only imagine how Judge Zhou felt about this farce. Why is it that Formosa Transnational was unwilling to play hardball? Why do they choose to be complicit in concealing the truth? For that matter, why does the presidential office want to hide the truth? Through these various congratulatory messages sent to Tsai, we see that Taiwan's foreign ministry is pulling strings behind the scenes. Many of the congratulatory messages shown had the exact same wording. Messages sent on May 20th were actually used in a court trial on May 29th. This means that Thesisgate has become a matter of national security. Current head of the National Security Council, Wellington Koo, once worked with Tsai at Formosa Transnational. What is his role in all of this? What else is hidden in the backstory of these congratulatory messages and what are the political implications here? U.S.-based independent investigative journalist Michael Richardson also has new findings to share. Richardson continued looking into the curious case of Tsai's Sunday Viva, the one that took place on October 16, 1983, and the external examiners that administered Tsai's Viva. I had three external examiners during my Viva. One was my supervisor, one was an economist, and the other was a lawyer. Richardson's investigation had him speaking with people from the University of London all the way up to the UK's Information Commissioner's Office. The ICO told Richardson that they would most likely uphold the University of London's decision to withhold information about size examiners because it was private information. Dissemination of private information may have resulted in distress or damage to those involved. Afterwards, they told Richardson that they would no longer look into the matter due to the pandemic. Ever unsatisfied, Richardson appealed the ICO's response and submitted it to the UK's Information Review Tribunal. The tribunal requires 28 days to review Richardson's appeal and should issue a decision on August 7th. Richardson's appeal includes several strong points of dispute, including
Richardson's appeal includes many points of public interest. There are many things he mentions that require full, truthful disclosure. However, the tribunal began questioning Richardson eight days after he submitted his appeal. The tribunal hinted that because Richardson does not reside in the UK, he has no right to file an appeal. However, when we look at the UK's Freedom of Information Act, we find that the law clearly states that anyone can make a request for information regardless of who they are or where they live. The text continues on by stating that appellants should only have their motives questioned if the authority has reason to believe that the requester hasn't provided their real name. The Freedom of Information Act clearly dictates that under normal operation, tribunals should not question an appellant's background. The case should be resolved and a decision should be handed down on August 7th. But why was it that the tribunal felt it necessary to question Richardson's appeal a mere eight days after he filed it? Did the tribunal go out of their way to find out Richardson's nationality before they processed his appeal? The UK's tribunal once said in a decision that the Freedom of Information Act makes information available to everyone. However, we find here that the tribunal is unwilling to abide by those words. Could it be that there's diplomatic pressure coming from Taiwan? Richardson may have hit a snag in the road, but this won't prove detrimental to his investigation as a whole. So long as a UK citizen can come forward and offer help, then the tribunal will have no choice but to process his appeal. However, we can't help but feel discouraged at the revelation that the UK tribunal is only willing to assist those in power. Thesisgate isn't just stalling in judicial mechanisms in the UK, it's also stalling in Taiwan. Three different court cases related to Thesisgate have all been handled differently. The first court case is the one Tsai Ing-wen filed against the three scholars. After 10 months, the prosecutor in charge of the case, Huang Wei, has made little progress, if any. He has not looked into Tsai Ing-wen, nor has he looked into any of the defendants. Dr. Dennis Pang went to the prosecutor's office to offer his testimony at the end of last year, and yet there was still no desire to advance the case on the prosecutor's part. The case merely exists in a limbo. Even the court clerk said that charges may not be pressed. Was this case merely for show? The second outstanding court case is the one Dr. Dennis Pang filed against Tsai Ing-wen on December 4th, 2019, alleging that Tsai's thesis does not exist. Judge Zhang Yonghui presided over the case. Judge Zhang never once set a court date, nor did she reach out to the plaintiff. On January 15th, 2020, just four days after Taiwan's presidential election, the case was thrown out. That day, the media published stories about how Dr. Pang lost his court case. The media knew of this information before even Pang himself found out. Judge Tsung's decision was based on the existence of a degree proves the existence of a thesis narrative. Though the decision can be appealed, it's clear that the judges are siding with the president. Even if Judge Tsung is unwilling to handle a case involving the president, she shouldn't cite fake and falsified documents in her decision to reject the case. On January 15th, the same day that Judge Zhang made the decision to throw the case out, Pang's lawyer filed a case against Judge Zhang for forgery. The claim here was that the decision Judge Zhang handed down was based on faulty evidence, Tsai's degree. The first trial in the case against Judge Zhang will take place on July 27th. However, only the plaintiff has been notified of that date. The defendant has not. It's very likely that the case will once again be put to rest without proper procedure.
The third outstanding case is the one Dr. Pang filed against presidential office spokesperson Xavier Chang on December 9, 2019. After two trial dates, both sides are engaged in a heated argument. The interesting thing here is that Judge Zhou Yuxuan, who presides over the case, refuses to handle it like the other judges have. He refuses to relegate the case to obscurity and let it get buried. During a trial on May 29th, he questioned Xavier Chang when Chang revealed that he published a press release announcing Tsai's intent to sue Dr. Dennis Pang without the president's prior knowledge. Because of this, Judge Zhuo ordered a thorough examination of evidence. This is possibly the biggest break in thesis gate. Judge Zhuo ordered Xavier Chang to bring Tsai Ing-wen's original degree to court at the next trial. This is a minor victory for thesis gate truth seekers. Yet our team of lawyers don't want to celebrate too early because they know the road ahead is difficult and full of obstacles. Firstly, let's go back to the case in Sri Lanka. The London School of Economics and Political Science has already proven that it will go to any length to defend its reputation. It has shown that it is not above falsifying certain things. Should evidence be requested from the school, then there may be questions surrounding the authenticity of that evidence. Secondly, processes to legally acquire evidence require a lot of time, especially when dealing with an international entity. It may take as long as a year and a half to properly obtain evidence. This is all time that the other side can use to devise new methods of interference. Thirdly, there is one very simple way that Tsai's degree can be validated without going to the UK. The degree Tsai used when she applied for work as a professor in Taiwan is in the country. However, it has been sealed away and made classified until December 31st, 2049. Under what qualifications did Tsai Ing-wen garner employment at National Tsengzi University? What documents did she use? Those documents now hold the key to this case. However, our lawyers have thrice requested those documents. Each time they have been rejected. Funny enough, head of the Education Ministry's Department of Higher Education, Su Junsung, once said that if the courts called for the documents, then he would help declassify them. Tongue 寄的資料會提供給這些單位來做審議,但是都是在進行行政訴訟跟司法訴追的時候。Oh, Why is it that our lawyers' request to see Tsai's employment documents have been rejected since December 2019? Is it because the courts have not sent a request, or is it because the education ministry refuses to evaluate them? The resolution of this case is so close, yet so far. Why is it that someone's employment history can be made so secret? Even when someone's credentials are being questioned, the documents that can provide answers are locked away. Let's say that Tsai took a position at National Tsengzi University in June 1983. How did she produce a thesis between January and June of that same year? While people were looking for Tsai's thesis, the Education Ministry sealed away those all-important documents on July 19, 2019 for the next 30 years. Just like Michael Richardson said, publicizing Tsai's employment documents is a matter of public interest. At the same time, if the documents are all authentic, then they would offer Tsai reprieve from this scandal. So why doesn't she share them? Tsai Ing-wen refuses to provide evidence. Formosa Transnational also refuses to bring out any original documentation. The Education Ministry sealed away key items. People are not stupid. 
They can see what's going on and they understand the greater implications these actions have for Thesis Gate. If Thesis Gate were brought before a jury, then Tai would have nowhere to hide. That is why Tai has not moved to implement juries in Taiwan's courts. She has gone against her word and her party charter. Though things may seem dark now, we're here to remind you that it's always darkest before the dawn. 您好，我叫Cindy，我是一名2020年人口普查员。我的工作是探访并协助尚未完成普查的家庭。我会佩戴口罩，以确保每个人的安全。普查数据有助于分配每年数千亿的公共资金，抓住这次机会。您可选择上